My journey from Sydney to Melbourne in an ML350, which you saw in August, was just fabulous. But what did I know? Australia was going to enthrall me more from Melbourne to Adelaide. Coming into Melbourne last evening with people jogging, walking, rowing on the lake, lots of hustle and bustle. It felt largely different to Sydney, which was a little bit more laid back, more relaxed, more calm a city. Now, we had dinner here. This lane was bustling as well with people. Lots of music, lots of noise, lots of ambience. Melbourne is famous for these laneways with lots of restaurants. And as you can see, loads of graffiti. We're also in the iconic centre of Melbourne where we have the National Gallery of Arts, Flanders Station. It's a lovely place to walk around. Melbourne's buildings are all pretty funky and interesting with a mix of historic and modern structures standing side by side. A day in Melbourne can easily be spent walking around. But getting out of Melbourne in the morning is like rush hour in any city. It takes time. Just after Geelong, as we hit Torque, I got onto one of the most fabulous roads I've ever driven on. So I'm on this wonderful, wonderful Great Ocean Road now. It's a road that goes entirely along the coastline, starts in Torque and ends in a place called Warnabool. I hope I'm getting that right, Warnabool, I think. And um, basically it's the largest war memorial in the world, even I didn't know that. I was just told that it was built by the soldiers that returned from World War I and uh, it took a couple of years for them to build but you, as you can imagine it's about 234 kilometers long. If you're a beach bum, Australia is definitely the country to visit. Everybody looks like they live their lives on the beach. Sunny disposition, tan bodies and a peaceful state of mind. In fact, life does centre around the beach in most of these coastal areas. I guess generally surfing uh, came from Hawaii. Throughout the Pacific there's a great tradition of, of people surfing on the islands. Uh, and it first came to Australia about a hundred years ago. And of course Australia such, having such a fabulous coastline. Uh, Australians really took to it. It's something that they, I, they feel, I think, naturally. And uh, of course, most Australians spend summer at the beach, so it's a very familiar thing to Australians to spend time in the water. I'm a sunny weather, ocean loving beach lover, and driving down this road was like attaining nirvana. The Great Ocean Road winds its way like a serpent hugging the coastline, and every bend offers a view of the ocean even better than the last. With the crystal clear water, sunny skies and lots of little stopover viewpoints, it's best that you ensure that you give yourself loads of time and a loaded camera to conquer this road. To add to the excitement, I had my hands behind the wheel of a brand new Santa Fe. Brand new in every sense and this is the version that will come to India early 2014. Out on the highway, it cruises pretty well gets up to 100 quite easily and frankly I haven't been able to go beyond that to even check it out thanks to the speed limits in Australia. Put your foot down, there's power. Have it hard and you do hear a little bit of noise though. Still being away from those breathtaking views, I finally got time to actually take in a little more of the car. Typically Hyundai, the interiors really nice, flowing lines, great dashboard, a bit cluttered with a lot of buttons over here, but nice dials, got a pale blue lighting in it. In fact, ergonomically really nice because they're big, the numbers are large, you can see everything really clearly. You've got all the controls on your steering wheel. I quite like this interior. The seats are pretty comfortable too. Law in the town for our night halt is actually only an hour and a half journey from Melbourne. But with so many photo stops, we took the whole day. It was a leisurely drive and I got to know the new Santa Fe a bit more. 
you know, this road is quite uneven. Uh, somewhat like the surfaces we might find in some parts of India, a little bit of broken tarmac. And the Santa Fe is handling it pretty well. Once you get to Lawn, Teddy's Lookout is a must-do destination. It gives you a cover shot view of the ocean road. Sunset at Eddie's Lookout is even better and you can spend hours just taking in the beauty and soaking in the sea air. It's a perfect way to end a day. When I arrived on the terrace of our hotel for a specially catered breakfast, I understood that the early wake-up call this morning at Lawn was absolutely worth it. There's something to be said about having your first meal with the rising sun. The view was great, the weather good and the breakfast fantastic. Well, looked like it was going to be a perfect day to hit the Great Ocean Road again. But this time around, it was way more spectacular than anything we had seen the previous day. Every time I thought it can't get better, it just did. The road hugged the coastline like a baby koala clings to its mother. With twists and turns, it never parted way with the ocean. And it's hard to keep your eyes on the road and concentrate on driving because the views are just stunning. For once, I felt it would have been better to be a passenger instead of being behind the wheel. Well, when it feels like that, it's time to take a break and get a better view. There are loads of little stops like this filled with local produce and yummy snacks and each one of them has an atmosphere about them. Each one a unique experience I soon realised. Mm, it's been a great drive this morning so far and I'm standing opposite a beach. I can smell that salt air. It's really refreshing but I need a coffee as well and that's why we've stopped here, Y River. Bikers that we've been watching along the way, the cyclists, they stop here for a break as well. Cycling seems to be a passion in Australia, not just a mode of transport or a way to get to work. They really enjoy it. They come out on the weekends in groups, cycle over about 120 kilometers or so at a time, I've been told. My thighs are sore just thinking about it. But I'm going to catch up with them and have a coffee as well. Australia is like a jealous woman and you can't be distracted for too long. Stop and she grabs your attention right back. And what a way she got our attention. The Twelve Apostles. Let me tell you I'm not particularly fond of helicopters. They seem to fall out of the sky too easily. But the shiny red machine and the friendly pilots and the prospect of seeing the Twelve Apostles from the air got me to put aside my fears. Come here and miss out on that copter ride, it's like getting behind the wheel of a Ferrari but not driving it. You'll miss the astounding sight of these sandstone and limestone formations that have been standing here as testimonies of time through the ages. Worn by weather, they are magnificent structures. Strangely enough, even though they're called the Twelve Apostles, there are only eight stacks. The last one having fallen in 2005, worn down by the relentless waves and wind. So, even if we count the fallen one, originally there were only nine. And despite my asking around, no one knew why they're called the Twelve Apostles. They are still awe-inspiring. We headed down to the beach after the copter ride to get a closer perspective to these testaments of time. I thought to myself, this has to be the highlight. Well, they were, but just one of the many of the day. On the road again, the windy sections gave me a chance to test the Santa Fe's handling. And though it handled the corners pretty decently, I soon realised that the Santa Fe doesn't really like to be pushed. It isn't exciting, it's a car that's more for cruising. 
Now, normally you expect a parking lot behind a cafe, but in Australia, surprises are all around, and we were in for a quality experience. Out there in the wild, just eating and sleeping, which is what they do best, we caught some koalas. To visit just the 12 apostles from Melbourne is a mistake. The rest of the Great Ocean Road is as fabulous as we discovered. Our next stop was the gorge. After soaking up the view for a bit, we headed to London Bridge, another stunning halt. So this is London Bridge in the middle of Australia. These sandstone limestone formations are all along this coast and form really dramatic views of the ocean. And this one really has a funny story behind it. In 1990, the bridge that was connecting mainland and this archway actually collapsed. And two people were marooned out there on the island and a helicopter had to be flown out later to get them off it. It's a pretty interesting story. Don't know if I'd like to spend a night there all alone, frozen out in the cold, but uh, it makes for a dramatic view. The colour of the water, the evening light and the majestic rock formation with the ocean air made for one of those lifetime experiences. This day was going down into my book of memories, for sure. And we still had one more stop to go, the grotto. Walking down to the grotto, our guide Douglas and me thought we should put into a picture the elation we were feeling. Well, that's how we felt. The grotto is yet another marvel and I had to get a little closer. Standing there looking out at the vast ocean, it made me wonder how all those years ago the seafaring adventurers discovered these countries. This part of the coast is also known as the shipwreck coast with its high wind and waves and it was hard to navigate this coast in olden times. But in the present, those very wind and waves make it a surfer's paradise. On the way out, we caught another elusive Australian creature in the wild foraging for his evening meal, the echidna. It looks pretty much like a hedgehog. Driving to Warrnambool, in all the excitement, we realised we hadn't got many shots of the car out on the road. So we decided to get some passing shots. Whilst we were hunting for a location, we chanced on Martyr's Point. At this point, nothing I could say can justify what we saw. I'll just let the pictures do the talking to the outstanding end of a superlative day. The impact of the Great Ocean Road was still sinking in when I woke up in Warrnambool. It somehow left me feeling so small and insignificant in the larger scheme of things. I was struck by the enormity of nature and its forces and yet was left amazed by its other aspect of gentleness and beauty. It made me think how much we need to preserve what we are left with. Coming into a big town like Warrnambool was like being brought from heaven to earth. The reality of city life began to sink in again. But Warrnambool itself had a history. I'm in a place called Flagstaff Hill. Behind me is Lady Bay where a lot of ships were shipwrecked. 15 or more of them and this little town is a replica of the way towns would have looked along the coast of the Great Ocean Road. Now a lighthouse was built here to guide the ships in safely and it's still functional. This continent is just amazing with its natural beauty and geology that dates back thousands of years. But its civilization as we know it today has a history that dates back just 200 years. With 200 years in their pocket, the Australian infrastructures and facilities, I have to say, are super. The way they care for their natural wonders, the convenience of everything provided and the discipline on every level is quite impressive. There's a will to improve all around and our next destination, Koreit, proved that to me further. So we stopped in Koreit now and I'm standing on the lip of what is a volcanic crater, about 28,000 years old I've been told. But the region was entirely wiped out and it was live till about 7,000 years ago. And uh, there's been a lot of work to 
to um, rebuild this area, replant the trees, get the animals, get the wildlife, the flora, the fauna going again. And I've got Chris and Shannon here who are going to take us down, walk us through it and tell us a lot more. Driving down the ash buildup from the volcanic crater is quite awe-inspiring. I was beginning to feel like a rabbit. I had eaten half of the corate vegetation and was hoping my tummy would hold out. Shannon and Chris also tried to get me to eat a grub that grows inside one of the nuts hanging out of the trees. And Chris promised me it tasted just like a rubber band. But since I'm not a rubber band consuming human, I wasn't about to try. Luckily, after trying to break a few nuts, they couldn't find a grub good enough to eat. The local inhabitants, the koalas and emus, seem to be comfortable coexisting amongst the visitors at the park. And a couple of emus decided to cross our paths real close as well. I'd absorbed so much, but Chris told me that no trip to Australia was complete without learning to throw a boomerang. Needless to say, as the visuals show, I just don't have it in my genes. Being out in nature time had flown by and Douglas was urging us to bid adieu to Korate and move on to our next stop which was just about 11 kilometers away. The charming little town of Port Ferry with its old cottages and main streets lined with little shops, it's great to explore. Apart from the town centre, the must-see place is the wharf. With all the boats lined up, it tells the history of the fishing culture of this little village. After Port Ferry, we had 183 kilometres to make our way to the state of South Australia, to Mount Gambia for our night halt. The drive was quite different from the ocean-hugging road so far and it took us inwards through national parks and the hilly sections. The barn was a fabulous night halt, an exotic little hotel which was literally in the middle of nowhere. Looking at the open vintage Bugatti in the parking lot, I realised we were lucky to have had some pretty great weather so far, but the sky had turned grey on us now. Getting to Blue Lake, I prayed to the rain gods to hold out for just another two days till my journey was over. But they weren't listening because just as we got to Blue Lake, there was a very light drizzle. It's a cold morning here in Mount Gambia. It's windy as well, but I'm at the edge of this most amazing Blue Lake. Now, I know when I say blue and lake, you're wondering what I'm talking about because water is always blue and lakes are blue. But this is a different blue. It's really amazing. It's got this depth. It's sort of azure. And if you look along the edges, you can see a lighter blue. Um, because I've sort of caught it at the end of its uh, stage where it turns blue. It's blue from November to April is what I've been told. And it's sort of fading out now, but it's a lot more vibrant earlier in the year. It's pretty amazing. It's the youngest, one of the youngest volcanoes in Australia. You can see the limestone and the basalt and ash that's been chucked out along the sides to form this crater. And pretty amazing to be just standing here on the edge of a volcanic crater. The sunny weather had given way to a cold nip in the air and we all had to get our jackets out. From the Blue Lake we headed just about 5 kilometers to another interesting geological figure, the Umferston sinkhole. This one though dry was very well preserved and even though it was intentionally done, the beauty was just, well, not too manicured, lending some of the wilderness feel to it. On our way down, we encountered a shy little possum looking for food. Yet another tick on the Australian wildlife list. The 
The road now wound its way through a forested national park, changing the scenery for us as well, until we came to the vineyards. Now, because of its cigar-like shape, the Kunawara Drive looks like we were passing through one giant vineyard. I've always wanted to learn a little bit about wine and be able to swivel my glass round and look like a pro, which is just what I did. Little heady with all the wine I'd had, I handed the wheel over to Douglas and headed down to end the day with a great meal. So today is my pretty much our last day in Australia, driving down to Adelaide from the Kunawara region actually, uh, from a town called Penola where we stayed last night. And I thought it might be nice to jump into the back seat of the Santa Fe and see how it feels. There's lots of nice storage areas over here. I can put my bottle in. There's a back seat pocket for little stuff that you have and even up front actually the cubby holes are really nice you can get all your stuff neatly in but I don't know if we have it neatly but you can in fact the seat is really comfortable I've got loads of space it's very spacious uh, floorboard is flat enough as well so a third passenger can sit really comfortably in here uh, and we don't need the seven seats up at the moment so You know, if, if you do have them up, this comes forward, but without that, you can push them all the way back and really get comfortable. There's a really nice aircon vent, very neatly placed, so you can angle it well. I've got the sun blinds here at the back, cut out the sun. I've got a nice armrest. I've got cup holders. This back seat is really comfortable. that this was going to be the last day of an absolutely astounding journey made me heavy-hearted. The day's drive was to Adelaide, but en route we had our last tryst with the wondrous Australia at the Narakoot Caves. Limited time, we really couldn't explore the vast caves, but our small tour was also quite a splendid display of stalagmites and stalactites. With the light playing on them, they're quite mind blowing, and the archaeological dig site made us realize how far they actually date. My journey through Australia has been exhilarating, stunning, beautiful, superlative. I could just go on and on and on. Uh, it's a country that everyone has to come to once in their lifetime. And I think the drive that I did from Sydney down to Melbourne and then from Melbourne down to Adelaide has been wonderful because it's given me a sense of a lot of Australia. We've had the ocean, we've had parts of the bush, we've had a little bit of the mountains, we've had volcanic craters. So it's really given me such a huge experience. It's been so wonderful. You know, every corner I've turned, every moment there's been something to see. There's just so much to do over here. I'm sad to leave, heavy-hearted to say goodbye. And this is the last look I'll get of the wonderful bush of Australia. But it's time to go.